Hey yo, hey yo, everyone, and welcome to another week of the Chainsaw Man Hashi the Half Hour. Today, believe it or not, we are already halfway through season one, which you know what that means. It means we are getting ever so closer to Demon Slayer's new season next month. Very excited about that. But here to bring the fire of Chainsaw Man, I am your host for the day. What is up, y'all? I am super excited to talk about these two episodes because the voice acting in these is phenomenal and I really cannot give enough to them. So shouting out all the voice actors, but specifically Power and Power really dominated these two episodes. So excited for that. Hi, everyone. Excited to be back. Excited to be talking about Chainsaw Man again this week. I'm really looking forward to it. These episodes are some of my favorites in the season. I think that this arc that we're like heading into, this mini arc, is probably my favorite in the entire season. So I'm really excited to talk about it. And I think we can just jump in. Yeah, well, it is a doozy of a few episodes. So like Emily said, we are gonna just dive right in and pick up right where we left off, which is Denji achieving his shonen hero goal. He 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 has done it. Close the curtains. We're done. We're done here. I can mark another anime off my list with five episodes. Easy peasy. Okay, jokes aside, he did achieve his goal. However, even though he got three successful fondles in, it was clear he was disappointed by this. Womp womp. We've never seen a shonen hero reach his goal so early on, and on top of that show, so much disappointment surrounding it. How do you think this contrasts other shows that we see, and where do you think Denji might go from here? I mean, just like everything else about Denji, I definitely think that accomplishing his goal so early contrasts pretty much every other shonen anime that I could think of. And that that started with his goals getting set as well. Like that happened really rapidly. And the payoff also happened rapidly. And I think both were disappointing in their own rights. Also kind of funny for us as the viewer. But you know, we already discussed this too. I think that what Denji is really seeking is like that genuine human connection. And I don't think that that's what's necessarily happening certainly not in a romantic capacity here between him and power there's no attraction there's no chemistry and we were just talking about how rank this scene was at the end of the last episode like there's just nothing special about it there's no real connection and i think that that's what denji is really seeking via a couple squeezes so what is he going to be looking for next something to answer for that human connection that he's so desperately seeking yeah i think that this scene was rank indeed, but also funny as hell. And I will say, since we're talking about squeezing boobs, this is an M for Mature audiences only episode, so please go ahead and use viewer discretion. But I loved Power's voice acting in this scene. The second squeeze is upon us, and Final Fondle has arrived, like it's a game show. It's just so funny in this moment. The comedic relief is on point. Where do I think Denji's gonna go from here? I feel like there's only a natural evolution for that, right? Like, he's a 17-year-old kid, and I think it's very easy to forget that a lot of our shonen heroes are so young, and, like, this is really a little bit grungier and a lot more realistic. I mean, it's part of the Dark Trio, not because I think sometimes, like, it handles such dark themes, but because it's so realistic about, like, what people want in the world. And I think this is just a realistic depiction of that. So maybe he is craving some intimacy or into me, I, see. So let that soak in. It's almost refreshing for him to be disappointed because you see this kid that had this goal and it was kind of a a pretty, I want to say not great goal, but a goal that was like, all right, you know, and once he achieved what he wanted, he realized that maybe there's a lot more to it than that when it comes to touching boobs. So kind of refreshing to see that he's like, ah, that wasn't quite what I wanted. Now, moving on, he's telling the story to Makima. Now, she does some interesting things here. She, first of all, is reading him like a book, which we've already established she can do. But this was another scene where I was like, man, is she good. Once he mentions that he wasn't very happy with how he felt, she says something about, well, you know, you know what? Brian said it. So I, I'm going to say it. There was a disclaimer. She starts talking about sex and she even allows him to catch another feel. She she talks about the emotional connection that two people need to have and how much better it is when you do it with someone that you truly know. Now, after leaning in about as close as you can get without kissing, she tells him she wants him to do something for her. And if he does it, she'll do anything. Sex. 
I've been saying the whole time that she is about as manipulative as they come, but this is a whole new level, isn't it? Hey, baby, let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good things and the bad things that may be. Let's talk about sex. Literally what she said, on point. Uh, yeah, nah, she's a bitch sometimes just because she literally is so bad. And this is like preying on like a puppy. That's not even fair. You're dangling a treat in front of a puppy and then she lets him cop a feel. What else is this puppy going to do besides follow every order that you ask for? I hate to see this happen to Denji because it is just instilling. It's giving mommy issues. It's giving me the ick, if you will. Oh, absolutely. And, and she's had his number since the very first moment that she saw him. It's it's interesting to see. And I think that she she certainly is not above using her feminine wiles to get what she wants. And there is something that she wants. Denji is useful to her in some capacity. And we haven't fully been briefed on exactly what that is yet. But there is something about him that she wants. Whether or not she'll actually follow through with this promise that she's making is besides the point. But it's enough to get Denji completely on her side as if he wasn't already. But but she's like dangling like heaven, the Garden of Eden in front of him. Like this ultimate goal that he's very inexperienced in. And she seems like she's a bit more experienced. Even if she's not, like, this this would be, like, end game for Denji. This is just another day for Makima, even if she does follow through, I think. It's a lot of talk about connection. And maybe for him, he has or will be misled to feel like it is genuine. She might do it, but she's not going to care. Yeah, she's definitely smart and manipulative here. And Denji is a very easy target. And now, like, she's preying on his, like, sadness that he finally got what he wanted and it just wasn't all that. So, what she's teaching him about the connection? Yeah, she's correct. I would say, you know, that that is definitely something that I think a lot of people should probably listen to, is that it's a, you, you should have a, a special connection with that person. But doing it in this way is still very manipulative. And, of course, she's also telling him to go kill this devil that is like the scariest devil ever which is the perfect segue into talking about the gun devil first of all we get our first shonen type backstory where we see aki with his family a snowy day means pain right i like my fight or flight response when i see a family in a snowy area mm, it doesn't feel good and it, it it was pain because he sends his little brother after playing a snowball fight to their house where their parents are to get some gloves and as he does that Aki watches as the house is completely destroyed by the gun devil including everyone in it ah shonen never change to an extent yes shonen sure loves to give us trauma this is a little bit different though because something about maybe the way that this scene is structured seems the most similar to other trauma scenes that kick off so many shonen animes but what's interesting about this is that it's not happening to our main character this is like to a side character albeit one of our favorites is just not the main character and we saw denji's trauma as well but but not much about his family so this is interesting to see like the grief of the character lie a little bit more closely with the loss of that family the way that we've come to understand and again again have it not be with the main character but that being said, I do think that there were a couple things that kind of turned even this scene on its head as well. Like, I, I really liked that Aki was not like this perfect kid, because I feel like in so many of those shonen scenes that depict trauma of this magnitude, it's happening to like a golden retriever type character. And it like, it's a character we already would have backed up. Aki's kind of mean to his brother in this scene, in this flashback that we get. And it's like, I don't know. It's it's like something about like, he's just acting like a kid. A kid who genuinely doesn't understand why his parents would need to spend more time with his sick brother. The sick brother seeming like the golden retriever character. And then him just kind of being like a 12 or 13 year old jerk in the scene. So I liked that because to me it made 
some of the grief that he's probably feeling feel to me as an audience member a bit more realistic and gritty because it's not perfect it is complicated i'm sure he has a lot of regrets i thought that this was really well done yeah this was crazy i still don't understand the gun devil yeah because as a manga reader it's really interesting to bring this to animation form because like it looks like it's kind of flying in like destroying the house but this trauma that initiates something is really different from like kind of like Emily was saying that it's not our main character, but it feels like main character energy. Aki feels like he's part of the main character here and it gives him his own spotlight. And I think that that's what's important is that like this show also gives each character a well-developed backstory, which I really think is nice to get. Sometimes in other shonens you don't get that or you get like that backstory, but it's not as compelling. Whereas like usually the main character has the backstory that directly relates to the current plot. And I think that this is really cool that it's like our side character that is super lovable uh, has like this tie to the call to action here. Yeah, I think it's interesting that Aki's backstory is the one that feels very protagonist, very main character-ish, but also has that difference where I think he does feel a little bit more looking back on it like it was truly his fault. Or at least he could have switched places with his brother because I think he did kind of selfishly just tell his little brother to go in and do it when in you know hindsight he could have done it himself or that sort of thing. And I think that's the case for a lot of shonen backstories, but definitely an interesting little background for Aki, which makes me love him even more because I'm a sucker for some sad backstories for sure. Now, some interesting points about the gun devil, a couple things. It was originated in America, which is not really a shocker for us. That was very, it caused me to chuckle almost. But I'm sitting here wondering how it got to Japan then. Like, did it swim? Did it fly? We saw it destroy like miles and miles of buildings. So it almost kind of just like floats, it feels like. But never mind that. Let's talk the plan that Makima comes up with. So the plan is essentially to gather as many pieces of the gun devil as they can. They're all magnetic to each other. So eventually, because they can't find it at the present moment, if, if they have a big enough piece, it'll literally like force them to the gun devil to find it. Seems easy enough. No. <laughs> no, probably not. So first to address like how does the gun devil move perhaps it shoots like a gun yeah that that's a that's just a thought obviously we've only seen a split second of what happened and like the speed with which it happened was crazy so that's my theory but that remains to be seen so maybe we'll find out later but yeah i don't think that this is gonna be a good time or a fast time <laughs> for our crew yes in theory it's like okay like it's magnetic and it should attract pieces of like the rest of the body, but they've been working on this. It seems like it seems like Makima has already been kind of like on this trail for a little while. And that box that she pulls out with the bullets in it that are already attached, like that's what they have so far. And it's not even a big enough chunk to like start to vibrate towards the main body. So it's going to take some time. And then let's say even if they do find enough of these bullets to get like a sizable chunk that will lead them to the gun devil then they have to figure out what to do with that because we saw like how that thing moves how it shoots or whatever like what exactly like what are you even gonna do once you do have enough to be able to find it i don't know so no no i don't think it's gonna be good or easy or simple i think it's gonna be like an end game villain in my opinion there's a reference they made on drag race that really relates to this and it goes where is the body? Because where is the body of the gun devil? We don't know, right? That's what they're trying to find. So no, this is not going to be easy at all. Nothing's ever easy in the shonen verse. I think that this is literally a last ditch effort to try and find the body. I mean, it's a smart plan. Don't get me wrong. But it's definitely very, we're doing our best. And like Emily said, like, what are they going to even do about that? Like, cool, Denji's got a chainsaw, but you brought a chainsaw to a gunfight. Like, unfortunately, you have lost that fight. Not sure what you're going to do about that, but it seems like it's not a good time. So, yikes, dude. 
Yeah, and this is just a plan to find it. We don't even have even close to a plan of what we do once we find it. And we know that like this happens all the time. I agree with Emily. I feel like the Gun Devil is definitely a end game villain that we're probably not going to fight for quite some time, in my opinion. I could be wrong. We'll see. We see that a lot in Shonen's where it's like, first we have to find the big bad. And then when we find him, then we have to figure out how to kill him. And that could be very, very difficult with lots of people dying. So we'll see how that goes. But we find ourselves on a mission at a very unsafe looking hotel from the outside, but we get introduced to some new characters. We've got Himeno, Kobeni, Hirokazu, and they all have some very interesting characteristics. Who stood out to you the most? Yeah, Kobeni, because she's the Zenitsu character of the group. She a little bitch, but she a, a lovable little bitch. She got that schoolgirl outfit on, and so she's definitely giving up that vibe of like, I don't belong here, but I definitely am here for some ungodly reason. Please help me. So definitely love that aspect for her. Kobeni definitely stood out to me the most too, and I think it's because she's just so funny to me. I always get a kick out of these characters that like do not want to be there. <laughs> They're like, I'm not paid enough. This is not going to work for me. <laughs> but like you're here though. <laughs> so I think that she's just like so funny. She's definitely that Zenitsu character. But at the same time, I'm like, that would be me though. <laughs> like you want to think that you would be this cool, like super righteous like brave character and i'm like no i she's actually probably better than me because i don't think i would even be touching any of this with a 10 foot pole so the fact that she's already there is hysterical and also the fact that she's there leads me to believe that like that she is there for a reason so like just like we have zenitsu who like eventually taps into his power when he completely blacks out from his panic attacks which like same uh <laughs> like she probably has something she probably has, like, something, and there's some reason that she's been recruited to this, like, devil hunting crew, so I'm excited to see what that is, and whatever it is, is funny, contrasted with her cowardice, so she definitely caught my attention the most, but excited to see Jimeno, though, too. Honorary shout out. I agree. I think Kobeni, while she is that loud, obnoxious, maybe slightly annoying character, she's so God damn relatable. And that's how I feel about Zenitsu too. He might not be my favorite, but that would be me. That would be so me. But you both mentioned Kobeni, so I'm going to call it Himeno. I think she honestly was the one that I noticed the most. Mostly because she seems very willing to do whatever it takes to get Power and Denji, who are like the little kids, had to be offered gum to focus, you know? She's like, ah, Clearly you will just do whatever I tell you to do if you get a kiss on the cheek afterwards. And now Denji's like, ah, but I need more than that. Okay, do you want tongue? Like, she never misses a beat, you know? So <laughs> she definitely sparked my interest. And I like her character design as well. It's very basic and similar to a lot of characters, but I like that that design. There's a reason why it's popular. But we have to enter this scary hotel, and quite a scary hotel it is. We get through some of it, we deal with a devil that was far too easy. Just keep a side note there. We suddenly notice that we are seeing things that we've seen before. In fact, we do a loop, we go up the stairs, and we see the blood of the devil that we just killed. Then they continue to test this out, and go up the stairs and when they come up they're back on floor eight seems like we are stuck on the eighth floor is that pretty freaky way to end the episode oh absolutely this is where we're getting into like my favorite part of the season this scene in the hotel is starting to become much more like a horror film to me that's really exciting because it's not something you see in shonen anime a lot and just not in a ton of anime in general it's like verging into that horror category, which I think is so interesting. It makes for a very different kind of fight than what we maybe have seen so far in the show. And I think it really leans into that love of cinema that we've seen demonstrated in the opening sequence. There's absolutely some nods here to like some other creepy hotels. We've got like, of course, like The Shining and like the use of repetition and pattern, maybe even like a little bit of Psycho and a couple others, but... It's like these iconic, infinite, creepy hotels that our protagonists are now going to have to find their way out of. And I'm sure it's going to be just as goofy as 
anything else that they have tried to accomplish. I'm not sure if they're going to like Scooby-Doo it out here, but I'm looking forward to it. And I think that it's just a really fun trope to bring in, especially this early in the show. Yeah, this scene actually reminds me a lot of the JJK hidden inventory arc scene where they're fighting in the infinite hallway, except there's no Gojo this time. Uh, Gojo doesn't exist. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. So big L's on the board for our team, especially because like, even if someone could help them, how would you get into the eighth floor? Would you get stuck there too? Who knows? Maybe we'll talk about it later. But honestly, like, this is really cool. I really like it just because these scenes where people get trapped really are very quickly apt to like break the group up. And it's all about like team survival dynamics. When you get into something like this, we had a conversation about this where like people like who don't understand like worth and value of like their life will crumble very quickly and like be the person to eat you in your sleep. If you got into like a wild survival situation, <clears throat> Coveny, that's all I got. I would definitely not want to be a part of this group right now. In fact, I never want to be a part of a shonen group ever. So I'm very happy that I am sitting here watching this from the comfort of my couch because I'm not a fan of getting trapped in a space that is unescapable. <laughs> Freaky. All right, moving into episode six. The stress immediately intensifies when they figured out not only are they trapped but time is frozen as well on 818. And that means no one can come to help them. Kind of like Brian just mentioned, there's no way anyone can get there and help them. It's like they are trapped in a non-existent world. Many already feel helpless with Kobeni completely freaking out. LOL, me. Denji wants to take a nap, also me, but not because I can't sleep in stressful situations. But sometimes I just want to take a nap. Every character here is reacting very differently to their predicament. How would you feel in a situation like that? And who do you relate to the most? Yeah, I'm going to go with Denji on this one because why not take a nap, right? I know what to do from being poor. Sleep. Because <laughs> you're hungry, you just sleep it away. There you go. Problem solved. No, I mean, honestly, like, he's used to it like a, what, what was it? A barely a mattress at that point in his life. And now he's got, like, a queen-size bed to lay on. Like, of course he's going to be happy. Of course he's going to take a nap. Like, what did you expect? I have, like, what I would want to react like and then what I would actually react like. And I would want to be calm and cool and collected. But the truth is, like, probably exactly what would happen with me is I would be freaking out like Kobeni is right now. So she just continues to be the most relatable queen. But then it would reach a boiling point. At, at which time I would then turn into Denji and would be like, I'll deal with it in the morning. <laughs> I am laying down. I am so, so, so very sleepy. I am so tired. Did you think about that? Did you, Mr. Devil Monster in the hallway, think about how sleepy and tired I am and how much I want to be on my sleepy time tea, chamomile, sleepy bear, sitting next to the fireplace shit? Because that is what I want to do. <laughs> and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that about sums it up. Yeah, I wish I could relate to Denji's nap, but I definitely relate to Kobeni here. I would say that, unfortunately, I don't think I ever get to that point. In a situation like that, I wouldn't know because I've never been in one like that before, but I probably would not be able to sleep no matter what. Well, I would love to get to that point. However, Himeno is as calm as ever. She's lighting up her last cigarette, though it is her last one, so that could be the reason why she's feeling pretty calm. We then learn a little bit about her past with Aki, that she believes he is the type to survive, and that he says, this is my first and last cigarette, as she finally, you know, kind of persuades him into it after a back and forth and trying to get her to do it. And of course, we know that's not his last one. Something that I enjoyed about this backstory was seeing Aki do something so silly, but proved that he truly cares about like his partner. And I think both Aki and Himeno seem very standoffish, and you can tell they've lost a lot of people in this job, but they seem to be pretty close. 
based off of their background. How did you feel about this little development? I thought it was really nice. It really helped to humanize them more, like especially Jimeno, since this is, you know, our first few interactions with her and, and seeing her interact with the crew. And she seems lighthearted. So to cut back to this kind of heavy scene, I think helps to ground her as a character a little bit more. And then there's also something interesting about what's happening with Aki because, you know, he's got an agenda with like revenge. He is definitely interested, I think, in pursuing this gun devil because he's the last surviving member of his home. So he's serious about what he's doing, but the fact that he is also like, you know, like Denji and maybe like everybody in the show seeking human connection means that while he's a little bit cold and standoffish, I think that he can relate to her grief. And so the means of communicating that in a way that is like maybe work appropriate or appropriate with somebody that you're just meeting for the first time, maybe it's with that cigarette, is like this sense of understanding is passed back and forth. It's, you know, it's not just the cigarette. It's like there's there's a deeper sense of understanding of loss. And so I think that they are well suited to each other. And I think him accepting the cigarette, even though he didn't smoke, is again, a way to try to understand and connect with her. So I think in a weird way, it's sweet. Obviously, I would prefer if my favorite character didn't smoke, but that's also besides the point. I think that it did a lot to show us how their relationship has developed in a very short little sequence. Yeah, I think that this was really interesting because like he at first he was like, oh no, smoking is really gonna rot your bones and is something that is gonna kill you and so I can't be doing that if I want to actually get my goal and so I think it was really nice to see kind of how he's growing and like how he's sacrificing some of his own values maybe to show that connection with others and I think that might be because he lost a lot of those connections early on so that like he's trying to value the connections he does have in this moment which I think is really interesting just because you don't see that in a lot of characters or this remorse kind of trope that you see in characters is like things they missed out on or things they're going to go back for. So uh, it's a really interesting kind of dynamic he's created here. I think it shows that they both are two people who don't want to really get attached to anyone, but as they got to know each other, they learned that they could. And Jimeno even mentions, you know, he's the one who's capable of surviving compared to all the other partners that she's had before because he's a little bit crazy <laughs> and I liked that I just liked that they both were very like no I'm not gonna get close to you at all because you're probably gonna die soon and now they clearly care about each other quite a lot here but things start to get even worse that seems to be kind of the theme of this couple of episodes in fact, the devil that power slayed is not actually dead. In fact, he is very much alive and much bigger. It poses a very, very dangerous threat, even more so than being stuck in this room because now they have something that they have to run away from. He also reminded me of the hand demon quite a lot, so we can count that as a demon slayer reference. Now, that devil offers a contract where they sacrifice Denji and he will let them all out interesting that he also offered a contract because he is bound to that then he can't say you know he can't go back on his word kobeni is literally ready to instantly sacrifice him she's been like knocked out in a bed and she's like got her knife she's like kill him <laughs> also probably something i would do but yep we're sacrificing the guy i don't like <laughs> it, it actually seems like most everyone there is ready to sacrifice denji the only people that are not are Himeno and Aki. What did you think about the contrast of these characters and their response to this contract offer? I think because they've seen a lot of loss in this job, I think that they know the meaning and the value of a life so that they don't want to just throw one away just to save their own skin if they can get away with it or get away without doing so. So I think it's really interesting that they both want to try and save Denji. I think with that, uh, they're trying to instill upon their younger ones that like no this is a team sport really and that you should be trying to get through this together so I think this is a really interesting kind of thing that they put together I mean I think that it makes a lot of sense Himeno and Aki of the characters that we've met seem to be more senior um in the crew and therefore closer to Makima's plan we at least saw Aki get 
an explanation, like like kind of briefly, even if Makiba didn't go too deep into, you know, her, her thought process. We know that Denji is important. That, like, yes, there is a mission to be finding these pieces of the gun devil, which is what we can assume they're probably trying to do right now. But ultimately, like, that fight with the gun devil is critical, and Denji is critical to that. And so Aki and Himeno know that, like, even potentially at the cost of their lives, if it comes to that, that Denji needs to get out alive. So I'm not necessarily surprised by that. Or by Kobeni, because she doesn't seem like she's a senior. I don't think she's aware. And even if she was, I don't know that she would agree or care about following orders that much. Not more than saving her own skin, which again, makes her like kind of relatable, kind of funny, deeply flawed. So I don't know. I, I, I think it's funny. And then <laughs> I love that Power is just like willing to like jump on whatever bandwagon like appeals to her at that moment. <laughs> She's also super funny in kind of a similar way, reacting certainly on like very animal instincts and like her just whatever she's going to be amused by. And then poor Denji's like, he's like, what did I do? <laughs> like, what did I even do? Why do you guys immediately want to kill me? I didn't do anything. I'm just trying to take my sleepy time tea bear nap. Not surprised, but it continues to build to the suspense and the intrigue of what's happening in this mystery hotel. Ooh, mystery hotel. That it is for sure. Like I said, Kobeni, she does exactly what I think I would do. You know, you see a way out, you, you take that way out. If it's not someone that you really care about that much, it's like, all right, sacrifice one to save the rest. Let's do it. But Aki and Himeno, like you said, clearly have that experience. They have seniority over them. So they are like, no, we can come up with some some other ideas here. Let's let's try and not sacrifice anyone. They try multiple different options, including Aki tries Kon and nowhere to be found. And Himeno has a like the ghost hand, so she tries to use that, but it only makes it worse and it fails miserably. The devil explains that this is not even his real body. <laughs> now we got some Enmu vibes from Mugen Train. Ah, Demon Slayer reference again. <laughs> Go me. Aki says he will offer to use his katana, but Himeno plainly states that she will sacrifice Denji before letting him use that katana. In the meantime, Power, Kobeni, and Hirokazu are turning on each other because Power decided to eat some food and then lied about it straight in their faces with her little chomp chomps. <sniffs> yeah, I didn't eat it. Ask Denji, who's not anywhere near here to the food that's on my mouth. <laughs> but they're turning on each other as fear and anxiety sets in even more. With their fear growing and their screams ringing out, the devil also grows. An interesting turn of events, I would say. Yes, and I, again, think that this dynamic is so entertaining. It is, like, really leaning into that horror film vibe. At this point, we're leaning into almost, like, those 90s, like, scream-type movies where it's, like, this group of teenagers at a party and they're all gonna do something stupid because they can't just calm down and think rationally about whatever's about to happen next. And I think it plays out in a really great way and this is our first time seeing kind of like that sentiment that we had learned about the devils where we are physically seeing this thing grow larger as their tension and their anxiety and their fear of whatever is happening is also growing. And we were told that about devils, but this is our first time seeing it happen in real time. And I think that, of course, that happening continues to build to the tension and it becomes this cycle so absolutely an interesting turn of events. Probably not the best turn of events for this group of village idiots that we have in the hotel right now, but it makes for great entertainment and they are going to have to figure something out pretty quick. Otherwise, they're going to probably get consumed, which would not be ideal. Yeah, this is super cool because it really does show the power dynamic in the show and it shows how this show really works and how the devils really do feed off of fear and how that like, fear itself has power to it and has meaning behind it so i think this is a really interesting way to get there and to really drive that point home not surprised by this turning on each other this is what that devil wanted from the very beginning is for these people to be turning on each other and i am not surprised by it one bit so this is definitely something that is you know a really good kind of tactic to try and get them to sacrifice denji so i think this is a really interesting one the katana is something I think we'll talk about in a minute, but I definitely think the katana is super useful and 
that could be used here. Yeah, it's definitely interesting that Himeno was like, absolutely not. Because she's been pretty hardcore on keeping Denji alive since this devil offered the contract. And she immediately told Aki, like, no, I will sacrifice him. You will not use that katana at all. Also, the devil using the fear of everyone, you know that he was a very much trying to get them to that point where everyone starts to turn on each other. And that's when he reveals he's the eternity devil. And he like they're inside his stomach and there's just like, there's no way out of it. And I feel like eternity devil could almost be more scary than gun devil, which is kind of insane. The powers that this guy is capable of is wild, but... As he reveals that they're in their stomach, the halls turn, everything gets actively even worse. We do hit the climax of the episode here, and everyone is very emotionally driven in this moment because death is looming closer and closer for them. Aki, once again, is like, I'll use my katana. He is totally willing to do that. And this is when we learn that in doing so, he shaves years off of his lifespan. So kind of crazy that Himeno is like, absolutely not. And I think it shows how much she cares about him, that she's like, I'll throw this kid in, into the stomach of this devil, but you're not going to shave even one year off of your lifespan. The price to pay is pretty high for using this. So it must be a pretty super powerful option, right? Yeah, I mean... There's a time and a place for a trump card, and it seems like right now might be one of those times. It sounds like if this sword makes contact with the devil, it might be the end of it. And so that might be something worth considering when the entire team will die if you don't do anything about it. A very interesting kind of consequence to come about of using your trump card. Usually they're not as effective or as effective at killing the person behind using it. Looking at just this scene, though, them all running down the hall... And then looking down kind of at the devil, you know, Himeno is almost strangling Aki and holding him back. This is a really interesting kind of scene from her as well, because she is vehemently against this. So it's definitely very interesting to watch. I don't think Aki's really thinking about himself in this scene. He is definitely well aware of what the price is um, and whatever maybe contract he's made to have a power like this. And I do agree that it seems like a trump card power for sure. I, I think that in this moment of panic and like trying to remain calm and think about a solution and with what seems like death looming on the horizon for everybody, he is just trying to think logistically, how can I get everybody out of here alive, including myself, even if that means that like maybe I'm gonna die later, but sooner than I thought. My goal is to get everybody out of here alive. And we, as the audience again, are like, well, this is still kind of early. We're only on episode six to be seeing a trump card coming out. And I think that to some degree, that's Jimeno's thought process here too, is like, we don't need to do this yet. Like, you don't need to sacrifice any moments of your life yet. So we're not going to do that. We're going to try to remain calm. Maybe we're going to let Denji try to do something. <laughs> Or, or we'll come up with something together, but like, don't go and do something stupid by yourself is the sentiment. It definitely does seem like a pretty hefty price to pay. And obviously I'm biased because I like Aki a lot. And so I don't want to see him shorten his lifespan at all. And yet selfishly, I do kind of want to see whatever this technique is, but maybe not now. Maybe we need to wait for a bigger, scarier villain for it to be worth him wielding this katana. Maybe for the gun devil. He seems very willing to use it. I think that shows a bit how selfless he is, but also, again, how much Jimeno, like truly cares about him, that she just is strangling him almost with her with her ghost hand and being like, you cannot do this. Very interesting turn of events, for sure. With now everyone but Aki trying to sacrifice Denji, Kobeni once again attempts to plunge her knife into him. But this time, Aki is not able to stop her super fast and instead takes the wound for himself. He states that he will not let Denji die because Denji will help him find and kill the gun devil. Being willing to take a stab wound for the guy who was just kicking you in the balls a few episodes ago is quite the change in him, right? To an extent. I think that there is definitely a difference between getting stabbed for someone or like being stabbed versus like getting kicked in the balls. Not saying that either is pleasant. <laughs> But I, I, I do think there is a, a hierarchy here. To some extent, I think that 
sometimes men need to discover and learn about each other through their fists and that is how they're gonna get along so somehow i'm like i don't know if it's respect that's not the right word but maybe like there's some kind of understanding between the two of them after like their kind of rough introductions because even denji now like we saw him like backing up aki like in front of power so maybe it's improved a little bit i definitely still think that they might be on like shaky footing but as we discussed a few minutes ago aki understands that denji is like critical to this mission that they have and so that means that denji needs to live beyond this so he's not gonna let kobeni get in the way and he has like partially a selfish reason here too because he as we also discussed is pursuing revenge against the gun devil and he believes in Makima's mission, and Makima's mission believes in Denji to be the one that makes that happen. As far as he is aware right now, it seems like it is in Aki's best interest to keep Denji alive, even if he's not his favorite person on the planet yet. Yeah, this is super cool to see Aki take a blow for Denji like this, because I think it really comes around to the single dad archetype that we've got going on for him. It's really nice to see that like he does care about the people that he has, even if it's not the most obvious or it's not the most outwardly expressed. And so I think that this is really cool for Aki to be able to step up for someone else and like really put his life out there for someone else, just because like a couple minutes ago, Himeno was like, no, you're not dying. And he literally put himself in harm's way again. So I think this is really interesting for him to like keep putting his life on the line for others. Yeah, I think it is definitely selfless of him, but I also think it's somewhat selfish of him. He quite literally states that Denji is the one who can help him find and kill the gun devil. So in a way, his desire to save Denji is simply born out of the fact that he thinks that Denji will help him with his revenge as well, which is still a little bit different than he was a few episodes ago. And I think it still is bringing out some of the selflessness in him. However, it is also showing almost how selfish she is because he's like, I'll take the few years off. Don't know how much it's going to be just so I can still see the gun devil die is kind of how I read that. Selfless, yes, but also selfish. It's very layered, I would say. Now, Power is able to help a little bit as Denji decides to try his hand at fighting and he's going to fight from within the stomach. He's going to offer himself up as a sacrifice and attempt to not die. <laughs> The last thing we see this episode is him jumping in while the others watch with wide eyes. Would you say Denji is growing up by making this decision? A little bit, yeah. I think he's growing up just a, just a smidge. Just because he's showing that he has like his ability to understand like others around him. And I think that he understands the situation everybody else is in. He's like probably the only one that can do something about this because he's part devil. And it looks like from so far, like the devil hasn't been directly attacking them for one reason or another. With that being said, he, he has a way now for himself to be able to attack. Looking at it, though, he jumped into the mouth of the Eternity Devil. So really, who knows how long he's actually going to be falling for. So that's kind of one thing to think about is like the gravity of the decision he just made. Yeah, I can't say that I would want to tussle with the eternity devil i think i would have to agree with what you said earlier hannah gun devil's obviously scary but there's something very existential and like dreadful about even the concept of the eternity devil so not a fan of that and i i think that you are even a little bit nicer than me brian i don't know if i would give denji that much credit <laughs> to be honest do I think he's grown up? Not really. If he has, I think, like, perhaps to teenage adolescence rather than, like, petulant child. And don't get me wrong, I like Denji. I think he's really funny. But he's he's doing this, like, with a price tag. Like, let, let us not forget that Himeno was like, if you can figure this out somehow, then I will totally kiss you as much as you want. And so he's like, yeah, it's gonna hurt really bad. Feel bad for me. And also, you owe me a big ol' smooch as soon as I'm done figuring this out. So it's like, yes, and maybe to, like, some extent there is, like, this desire to help the people that he's with, and maybe there is, like, maybe this desire to show off a little bit, too, because he's, up until this point, been really alone. So I think it's, like, a, a mix of all of those things, but all of those, even together, are still, like, innately immature. No, I don't think that he's grown up that much. 
That doesn't mean this isn't going to be cool as hell to watch, so I'm really excited for the next episode. I would say maybe a tiny bit, because I do think he cares a little bit about Aki. I, I think he, he asked power to help. He was like, aren't you the blood fiend? Like, can't you help this? So I think he genuinely actually cares a little bit. But at the same time, I kind of feel like he waited until he was like, all right, I think I could probably fight my way out of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, now that he's like, all right, she's out of commission with the knife. No one else here is going to try and kill me. I'll just jump in now and try to fight my way out so that I have a fighting chance. So I think there's a lot of things going on in his mind, but I think he's grown up maybe, maybe a teensy little bit because he does seem to care about Aki at least a little bit. We'll go with that. All right. Well, we're chugging along through this season, so let's talk about those favorite moments in these two episodes. I will go first, and I would definitely say Aki taking the blow for Denji. Not only do I think that it is still like a really interesting move on his part that feels very protective, I also liked how layered it felt when he mentions that it was because Denji is one of the ones that could take the gun devil down because I think that it one, like I said, showed a little bit of his like selfishness in doing this and the need for revenge. But also, and something I didn't touch on earlier, is that it shows how much either A, Makima is manipulating him as well and is being like, Denji can do it, Denji can do it, or he's accepting the strength of Denji and understanding that he is capable of doing that. So I really liked that moment. It's almost hard to just pick one. And mine is probably still going to cheat that a little bit. But I mentioned that these are like some of my favorite episodes in the whole season. And part of that I've realized is that Chainsaw Man does a really, really nice job of setting very memorable scenes and like very, very distinct settings for the characters, which is not always the case in animes. I feel like sometimes, if anything, the backgrounds or the locations are even a little bit lacking. And that might be partially because there, you know, there's just like a budget allocated for something. Um, and it's usually the characters more so than like the setting. But I think the setting is really important to the story of Chainsaw Man. And I really love these episodes because like almost this opulence of the hotel and like the colors, like the rich gold tones contrasted with like maybe some of the red blood that we're going to see. We saw a little bit when the the small version of this eternity devil was killed. But even in these episodes, it's contrasted with very, very stark imagery as well. So like from episode five, one of the scenes that really stuck out to me was Aki, of course, and like that flashback and him walking with his brother down that like really stark and kind of bare like tree path. And, and like the lines and the shapes of those trees, like there was something very ominous about it. And then again, in episode six, when we see Himeno and Aki in the graveyard, it almost reminded me of the trees and like the, the lines and the shapes and the color scheme versus the opulence that's like in this hotel. And I think that Chainsaw Man does a really nice job of marrying scenes like that together. And it just makes for like a really rich and textured story. And I think adds to the complexities of everything that each of these characters is going through. So I'm going to shout that out and I'm excited for next week's again. Yeah, there's a lot of different moments to choose from here. I think that there are two really good episodes for different reasons. I think whether you're looking at the horror aspect of episode six or you're looking at like this kind of contextual episode and like world building episode of episode five, it's really a definitely a good set of episodes that I'm glad we get a chance to talk about. But I would have to say Power's voice acting with comedic relief has been the best so far. She called Aki in English my liege when she was given gum at the very beginning of episode five. <laughs> the way she said, I'm captain of Team Kill Denji is like just so stupid. She's literally so funny in so many different ways. And it's just like, how unhinged can she get? And it's like, she just breaks the meter every time. There's a new ceiling every time. I'm captain of Team Kill Denji. Oh, I would have loved to say that line in a booth. I'm just like, <laughs> oh man. Well, all good 
parts. Very, very excited to keep talking about the rest of the season. But that is all that we have for today, everyone. So don't forget to download the episode, leave us a five-star review, and answer that Q&A to get a chance to be featured in an upcoming episode. You can also find the full video format on YouTube. And if you are watching on there, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click on that notification bell to stay up to date and all of our episodes are posted. And finally, we are on social media. So we are on TikTok and Instagram at Hashira Half Hour and on X at Hashira Half. We once again thank you for joining us this week and we look forward to next. And as always, Kon. 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 <laughs>